I'm Jay Horton. I make movies that make money, and this is Filmmakers On. Today, I'm talking to one of the heads of Siphuno Ventures, an independent sales rep company, uh, John LePere. John is a super nice guy, and he's been in the business for a very long time. And he dropped by today to basically dispel some misconceptions about sales agents and distributors in general. Full disclosure, I've never worked with Saifuno, but I have heard good things about him, and I've known John for a long time on social media, and he really seems to be a genuine, legit individual. Let's do the interview thing. So guys, today I'm here with John Maker. He is the co-owner of Saifuno. Um, they are a distrib or a sales agency distributing sales agency. Yes. Okay. So officially a sales agency, co co owner, founder, co owner, co owner. Uh, I've been a uh, co owner of the company for about uh, probably about two two and a half years now. Okay. Uh, the company was founded by my senior partner uh, Adam Witten uh, close to uh, a decade ago. How how did you get involved in distribution? Well, honestly, uh, I did kind of fall into it. Uh, I went to school actually to become an actor. Um, I was actually, uh, I studied theater at the University of Southern Maine under the same professors that trained uh, Tony Shalhoub. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, they were in uh, semi-retirement by the time I got there. Uh, there were two of them and they would alternate semesters where one would be on and one would be off. Uh, but I get, did get to uh, learn under both of them uh, during my tenure there. Yeah, so I, I wanted to be an actor, uh, but while I was in college, I actually um, fell into a couple of uh, producing uh, roles where I helped uh, fund a couple of low budget films. And one of those was actually my first film was, uh, it was a real low budget piece of crap. I put like $500 into it. Um, but you know what? My uh, Adam, uh, uh, he's my senior partner now. That was his first movie that he helped find distribution for. Uh -huh. And it was, it was a real low budget movie, but he, he got it with Gravitas Ventures. They got it up onto Hulu and uh, we made some decent money off of it. And it was, you know, we, I kept in touch with him throughout the years. Um, at one point uh, I had my hands in all sorts of different projects I was working on. At, at, at one point, I was actually the owner of a, a horror news website, uh, thebloodshed.com. And one of the things I was trying to do off of that was actually create a uh, video on demand platform mm. for uh, low budget horror films uh, that were self-distributed. Uh, I called it uh, I Bleed Indie. It did not perform well but I, I, he, Adam was impressed with how many films I was able to pick up. I mean, by the time I launched the site, I had about 150 horror films in the catalog. Wow. Um, so yeah, he was impressed with my ability to reach out with, to people and, you know, talk to them about, you know, placing films. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, he brought me on board as a uh, freelance scout, which I did for a few years for Sifuno. Basically, I would uh, reach out to prospective projects uh, see if, you know, they might be interested in Saifuno helping them. If they were interested, I would, you know, get them signed on and then forward them on to Adam. And he would actually do the whole sales process, shopping the film around for distribution. Two and a half years ago, I became a, a co-owner and now I have heavily involved in a lot of the, uh, the sales aspects directly. That's cool. So Saifuno is, it's technically a, a sales agency. So you guys are, are sales reps for, for people that don't know how, how, how do you define a sales rep? So basically what we do is um, we take uh, finished projects, you know, uh, once the, once the film has, you know, finished shooting, uh, being edited and there's a, a finalized project to be shopped around, we sign them on. And uh, we shop the film around to our network of distributors. Uh, we work with pretty much every legitimate uh, genre distributor in operation in the United States. Uh, we work with all budget levels. And, you know, we just, we try to get people the best deal we can from an actual legitimate company. Because the problem is, you know, there's a lot of sketchy distributors out there. Unfortunately, it's, it's, a, it's a real minefield. And, you know, sales agencies, they can be useful to people, whether you're just new to the industry and you're not familiar with the distributors and, you know, you, you want to avoid the pitfalls or, you know, you're someone that's been in the industry for a while 
and you just want someone that has a lot of the contacts for some of the, the top tier, maybe more difficult to contact companies so you can see what other offers are out there. Right. I, I find as a filmmaker, especially I've, I've been doing it almost 20 years now. And especially when you strike out into something new or, you know, a, a new type of genre or a new type of budget level, like, you know, even me sometimes when I'm dealing with distributors and I have a lot of experience dealing with distributors, but having those contacts that you have in that experience, you guys are better equipped to, you know, know who's going to be a better fit you know, who like, and who's not going to be predatory or, you know. And one of the things that actually sets us apart from a lot of other sales agencies out there is we actually, some agencies out there, they might just like get you a deal and then, you know, just their duties done. They wash their hands, you go other separate ways. Mm -hmm. Saifuna, we actually stay on as part of a, of a filmmaker's team, even after a deal is signed. And we help facilitate the ongoing communication with the distributor answer any questions, help with things like marketing marketing or aggregation. You know, there's all sorts of stuff that we help with even after the deal is done that's just included in our package. Right. And, and I know th things have changed a lot over the years, but like uh, like dealing with a, a general new project today, um, is it, do you pretty much, do you guys look for like a single fit worldwide release or do you look to fracture or is it just, is totally just a project? It project? really depends on the project. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what companies make what offer. I mean, we work with a few different companies that work a few different ways. I mean, we have one, we have three companies in particular that actually work a, a very interesting way. They, they, they're kind of a uh, distributor sales uh, agency hybrid where what they do is they will pick up a film, release it themselves domestically, and then act as the sales agency internationally to get it into as many territories as possible. Right. And um, that can work out very well. Um, uh, you know, it can definitely get you into a lot more uh, territories than you might otherwise. Because a lot of times, um, especially with some of the uh, the smaller uh, indie distributors for like domestic, if they want the world worldwide rights, they're mostly still only going to get the movie into like probably just the English territories. Yeah, because it, it's it's expensive to do like the subtitling or dubbing. Yeah, I know a few, and I, I I've dealt with a lot of uh, the lower end distributors, and, and many of them are. Like they're very straight up, they're honest, they pay you. But when it comes to foreign, a lot of them, they, they, there's not a lot of reach there. And it is mostly the English speaking territories. Like I, I remember doing my first horror movie back in like 2008, sorry, second horror movie. And uh, like I, they did a Japan deal for like, I, I was like 20,000 or 25,000. And, you know, but I was with Anchor Bay and then, you know, they yeah. licensed foreign to, uh, I think it was Lionsgate. I can't remember now. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of misconceptions and like bad blood amongst indie filmmakers, especially newer ones, um, or and some more experienced ones that just, I guess they just don't know any better when it comes to distributors or sales agents. Like, you know, like you, you like you'll see these uh, some of the, and I won't name them, but you see some of these awful groups where they, you know, jump on, you know, distributors and sales agents, and they're all bad and they're all evil. Like, how how does that how does that myth perpetuate itself? Because it's not I mean true. It's really not. I mean, I, I know the types of groups you're talking about and, you know, some of the companies that are called out and that are, you know, they do deserve to be called out. But yeah, then yeah. There are there are legitimate distributors that are just having their names dragged through the mud because people are just disappointed in how a film performed. Right. And I mean, with some of these films, I mean, they're not going to do a ton, unfortunately. I mean, depending on the, the company, um, I mean, there's some companies out there that the best thing that they'll be able to do for you is just the placement. I mean, they're still going to, some of them, you know, they'll be right up front. They're not going to really market it. Right. Um, and, you know, so unless you do your part to really push the film uh, to the public awareness, it's not still not going to really perform super well. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're just talking about like the potential for these micro budget films anyway. I mean, a lot of them are a very niche market, very, yeah. very niche um, so they're not, most of them are not going to make, you know, millions of dollars. It's just <laughs> not going to happen. Right. right. Um, so I, I try to get people to get their investment back and then make maybe a decent profit on top. That's, that's what I try to do. And sometimes it even fails with, with us. Yeah. It's just, you know, it doesn't 
always happen. You know, some of these films, they get out there and they just make, you know, a few hundred dollars or whatever. And, you know, people are thinking the distributor stole from them. And it's just, you know, that's what the film made. And, you know, they, some films, you know, if they make a tiny bit, but they have a lot of them in their catalog, you know, they're cut of it. That's enough for them to stay in business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of it just comes down to uh, filmmakers just not completely understanding the marketplace or you'll get some older filmmakers that were, you know, that were, you know, doing decent, like in the big, like DVD boom years, right. you know, like between whatever, 2000. I, I missed that, unfortunately. I've heard uh, it was great. Oh, it was aw- I mean, I caught kind of the tail end of it. Like I started putting movies out in 2006, I think. And we were, st- I think we we're still doing well all the way through like maybe 2013 or 14. And it, like to, you know, where we were making big red box deals and stuff like that. And I, I think you'll get filmmakers that maybe came up in that time period, you know, and they, they seen some of those deals where, you know, you might get a red box uh, license for six months for, you know, yeah. 40,000 or $50,000. And well, I just, box is great if you can get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I just don't think it, it, well, it still can happen. It's just, it doesn't happen nearly as much and it doesn't happen no. at the level that it was happening then. So these guys are thinking, well, gosh, you know, in 2012, I released this movie and, you know, we made $85,000 know, on these channels and it's, these channels just aren't, they're not paying that anymore. No, especially like Amazon. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, Amazon <laughs> used to be like the biggest one for like, you know, the, uh, self-distributing filmmaker oh, yeah. and people used to be able to actually I think make decent money on there from what I understand yeah yeah it was it's very difficult to do now because they keep lowering the metrics uh, right now I believe the bottom metric for uh, for films on prime is only like three cents per hour of viewing yeah, it's, uh, and, it's, it's, it's one cent an hour for anything. Really? Yeah. Anything with a CER under last, last I did the math, anything with a CER under 60%. Yeah. Like, so, so it's, it's, yeah. it's horrible. It really is. Um, yeah. And you know, you really have to, you really have to get a lot of views for that to add up to something. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I to put it in context, I had a documentary last year that was streaming uh, two or 3 million minutes a week you know, a, a week. And at the one penny an hour, it earned, I think it was like 15, 1500 a month, something like that on Amazon, which is not nothing, but it's very low. And if that would have been four years ago, that would have been about 15,000 a month. I haven't looked at the reports recently yeah. to know for sure, but Velocipaster, for example, I bet you that, um, doing that right. movie was number one for a while. Uh, any move, any genre for Amazon on 29 in 2019. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's still made more money on Tubi. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 (laughs) I I, I mean, I, I I can't name the title, but I I just put up a a title for uh, another filmmaker I work with through uh, film hub and uh, on Tubi last month it did. I mean, this is a 10 year old movie, like cheap movie. It made $15,000. It's exactly. Tubi is dragging films that have been below water for years. Yeah. Finally making a profit. One of my, one of my, actually it was my third movie. Uh-huh. Uh, so before I was helping with distribution, it was another movie I put some money into. It was a found footage film called Moth from Hungary. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually enjoy it. Uh, it was it was pretty pretty well made. I, lo- I love the filmmakers. Um, they uh, but yeah, it it never made a cent uh, for years. But now it's on Tubi TV, and it's actually finally making money after just you know half a decade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I mean, I directed a ton of movies for a company called AMG Film Partners uh, between 2010 2015. And they were pretty much doing, you know, they were riding, riding the DVD wave and they did, they did well, but from like, you know, 2016 to, you know, whatever, 2020, they didn't like nothing. Like they were seeing nothing, pennies, you know, pennies a month until uh, the sales agent that, uh, that they work with. And he kept telling them like, you guys gotta let me, let me put this up on all these streaming platforms. And they're like, no, it's going to kill the DVDs. Like your DVD sales are already dead. Just try it. So they did, man. And those guys, I mean, they're making hundreds of thousands. Yeah. And now they have a big library, but they're making a lot of money off these old movies now. I, I don't mean like a hundred thousand a piece, but like collectively. Right. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, crazy. Tubi is definitely great. I think that uh, the AVOD um, uh, model is really beneficial to uh, independent filmmakers. 
Yeah. Um, it's definitely superior to the the subscription model, I think. At, le- at least I will right tell now. you though, Tubi, uh, not, uh, Shutter does really good deals. That's one of the companies we actually do work with uh, directly. Right. Uh, we got the uh, the Tom Savini documentary up that on there, and oh, nice. they do very very solid licensing deals. That's great. Yeah, I think I think what happened, you know, so we had we had a DVD boom, then we had, uh, you know, SVOD was big for a while when Amazon was doing well, and then that started falling off. Now AVOD is the thing, you know. It's just you know the business changes. You know, it's all about uh, you know adapting. Just gotta yeah, you just gotta evolve with it. It's all you right. can do. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, my, that first movie uh, that was on Hulu, that was back when Hulu was doing a VOD. That's what I uh, remember they used yeah, to yeah. do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I had a movie uh, on there. Hulu used to do really good sales when they were, they were a VOD. That's why those checks were so nice was because of the Hulu. Now Hulu just does really, really small, not very good licensing fees. Right. Uh, right. We had a film on there um, actually just this past spring, uh, Carrion. Mm. And licensing fee was under under five digits. Yeah, I don't doubt it. I, I I've heard similar things for Netflix for uh, lower budget stuff, which they don't hardly take at all anymore. No, they're mostly focused on their uh, their yeah. uh, their in house productions at this point. Yeah, it always cracks me up when people start talking about, oh, I'm going to get my movie on Netflix, or the, like, they're working so hard to get a movie independently produced onto Netflix. I'm just like, even at a even at a larger scale, your chances are not good. Make a make a horror movie. Try for Shutter. <laughs> they they right. they operate the same as Netflix, and they actually pay decently. Yeah, like, <laughs> that that's really cool. So, like, how many like uh like ballpark wise, how many films do you guys represent? Um, like at a given time, or how many have we like found distribution for? Like total as a company, it's like like a total, like a total, like a. We, we're probably getting close to a hundred films total as a company. Oh wow! And see, that's still relatively small for for a company that works like that. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, we we try to make sure we're not handling too many projects at, at a time because we mm-hmm. want to make sure that we are, you know, giving each one our, our uh, the amount of att- uh, attention it deserves. Mm-hmm. Plus, you know, it is it's a niche market, so you know, there's also not as many projects to pick up. <laughs> that's true too. So, and you, so when it comes to uh, the types of films that you guys take, what, like, what is your, what is your, I know it's horror, but like. Is horror there... is definitely our favorite. Yeah. Um, we do work with, um, we, we'll consider any genre really. I mean, we've actually done a couple comedies, um, an action film. I, it's actually doing fairly well called uh, holiday Monday oh, hmm. from over in the UK. I'm looking at a horror Western right now. Oh, wow. um, but yeah, so definitely horror is our favorite though. We try to avoid, we try to avoid comedies and dramas unless there's names involved because those are really difficult to place. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as like, like what types of horror films, uh, we definitely love weird stuff. Uh, yeah. We've been having so <laughs> much luck with weird stuff. Uh, Don't Fuck in the Woods and Velocipaster have been really good to us. And I'm, I've been really looking for more like the next film that might do as well as those two Mm -hmm. uh we do have don't in the woods two uh should be out uh, early next year it is uh screening at uh horror hound weekend nice uh, nice. next month other than that i like i really love uh i love creature features creature features i can usually find really good deals for if the special effects are really good Mm -hmm. uh even if i don't have a name i can usually uh, get some sort of upfront for them slashers are a little bit difficult nowadays paranormal has been done to death art films are um, one thing where i have to separate myself from like my job because i personally love like art horror films Mm -hmm. but distributors don't um yeah it's very very difficult to find distribution for those and you know when i when i do get presented a project that i don't think i can handle I do try to give some people, you know, people advice on like where they can take it. I mean, there's some like niche uh, distributors that are just, um, they're too niche for us to really work with, but I'll send people their way. Like right. SRS uh, Cinema, uh, they're a really good, uh, you know, my, uh, independently owned uh, distributor for really micro budget horror films and and larger ones too. They've actually gotten some uh, some decent bigger stuff signed on with them. But the way they operate is just it's just a little bit different from what we do. So we don't really work with them directly. But they're still, as far as I've heard, I've heard great stories about how they work with people. 
so I mean, there's there's other people that there's other places we can send people. Um, another company we actually work with uh, as a side thing is Horror Pack. Actually, is speaking oh. of uh, physical distribution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've actually placed um, I want to say four four films in Horror Pack so far, four or five. And there's only so many you can do because I mean they only do four discs a month, and usually mm-hmm. only one or two of those is like a micro budget or indie film. Uh, so at the most, you're only looking at them like picking up 12 to 24 of those in a year. Right. Um, but I mean, we have pretty good place, and we've actually, I think I got my, uh, pretty sure that's my, got a couple horror pack. Oh, there's a horror pack. Huh? A horror pack release for a uh, UK home invasion film we repped, uh, Nefarious, okay. um, and a couple others. Um, I love working with them. I mean, they, they, it's not a ton of money, but I mean, as far as physical media, I mean, they're usually good for about a thousand units, which is nothing to cough at. Right. No? Yeah. So another uh, kind of misconception, because I, I definitely think it has dropped off. You know, I, I think that's a fact, but DVD is not quite, it's not dead. No, not dead. Yeah. Um, but definitely more of a niche thing. I think a lot more people do stream. Um, I mean, yep. honestly, I'm a collector and I still mostly stream. I have my D, I have my copies, but they're, you know, they mostly just sit on a shelf. Yep. <laughs> Honestly. I'm the same. Uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, and that's, I think mostly what drives that still is the, co- is collectors at this point is mm-hmm. what really drives that keeps the physical media side of things alive. I mean, I do have a fair few films that I've distributed that have never gotten any sort of physical release. It happens. Yeah. Uh, one of them I really wish did, Furry Nights, is hilarious. That's one you can see on Tubi. Yeah, I was going to say, it's been, it's, it's probably been two years since I've done a, an actual physical release. I've been doing mostly documentaries the last two years. So, like, I, I've done almost all streaming. Yeah. Like you guys work with a lot of different distributors and I, of course, I don't want to, you know, call out it or throw anybody under the bus. So what, what, what are some of the, what are some of the good ones? The ones that really stick out? I mean, there's, we, the way I work, since we work, we handle like all budget ranges. Mm -hmm. I, I actually split distributors into like three tiers. Okay. uh, Low, mid and high. And that's not talking about like their actual quality. It's just kind of referring to like the level of product that they're like most equipped to handle. Right. But basically Um, budget level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So they're all like quality, legit companies. We vet all the companies we work with. They're all honest. They all have a history of financial stability and reliability. So like some good ones, you know, I mentioned Gravitas Ventures. They're still a good one. Yeah. Uh, Wild Eye uh, is really good for low budget um some mid budget ones that uh mid range ones i really like are like uncorked i started working with one i really love cleopatra semi recently okay have you heard of them no i have not okay they're they're um they're veterans in the entertainment industry but they're newer to film they started as a music label Hmm. um so it which opens up all sorts of doors in and of itself um they handled um but they handled uh that movie uh, death house um oh. you know that was marketed as the expendables of horror yep uh yeah and they got that up onto netflix so they have excellent reach uh i consider them a mid to high tier company for sure uh hmm. like and because of their music uh background they're really great for handling anything that has any sort of like musical talent attached to it Mm-hmm. Uh, I got distribution. I got a deal, a really good deal from them for a movie that just released a couple months ago, Baphomet. And yeah, they picked it up, gave it a really good MG, and uh, they basically gave it priority marketing, focusing on uh, on Danny's uh, involvement. And they actually got banners for the film up on uh, Blabbermouth, like the mm-hmm. biggest uh, metal site, uh, metal news site on the web, for like a week advertising the movie. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they really had a lot of synergy between like the film and like the music side of things. Um, something like uh, like uh, Velocipaster, who who put that out? That was Wild Eye. That was Wild Eye. That that oh yeah, that, that guy. That, that blew. I up. mean, that was uh, everywhere. Yeah, Wild Eye is uh, when they really want to put their mind to something. They are they are re- a really good company. They have a great marketing uh, firms that they have access to, and uh, you know when they decide that they want a movie to be like one of their tentpole titles. They put a lot of power behind it. And um, Philosopher is was one of those titles. And um, they, they really 
they really handled it well. Yeah, I just heard it on an episode of uh, How Did This Get Made? And I was like, holy, <laughs> I mean, that's great, man. Con- also, con- congrats to them. <laughs> they also uh, handled another film. Um, well, they've handled a bunch of films that we've yeah. helped with, but they they handled uh, another film that was interesting. Uh, it's up on Tubi TV right now, mm-hmm. Scrawl. Um, oh, yeah. Which is actually, um, I do have it back there. I'm not going to look for it, though. That's fine. Uh, I do have it. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's it was a student film. And it is Daisy Ridley's feature debut. That's Ray from the new Star Wars film. So, um, when it when it comes to deliverables, what 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 do your guys' deliverables look like? I mean, for us to look at a movie, really, all we need is a screener. Um, the deliverables for like an actual distributor vary from company to company. Right. So, like when I when I I've I've only really worked with one sales agent. It was years ago, but like I had to deliver everything to them, and then they delivered to the platforms. Is that different with you guys? Oh yeah, we uh, okay. we will 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 definitely help make sure that you get everything over. You know, we usually stay in the email chain, but once we get the deal signed, we put you directly in touch with the distributor. Oh. Okay. And then we just stay in the in the conversation to help along if anyone needs something explained or whatever. What are you seeing like uh, mistake wise, you know, from filmmakers that are submitting stuff to you that maybe you don't take? I, we do need like a certain level of production value. I, if, it, if it's just something that was, you know, made with like a cell phone in your backyard, it's probably not going to be something that we can do much with. I'm going to say probably because even then there's still, you know, it depends on your on your abilities because one of the best horror films I've seen in the last 10 years was called Found Footage, uh, no, Fear Footage, and was made on a hundred dollar budget shot and edited entirely on an iPhone. Right. So, I mean, it can be done. I would have loved to rep that movie, but they decided to self-distribute. Hmm. Uh, people should definitely check it out, though. But um, so stuff like that. Um, anything. I've had a, a few that just like the the content or the the mentality behind the content just like i had one guy who he sent me it was originally going i'm not going to name the film the title the filmmaker anything yeah yeah but like uh he originally was i uh he was talking about sending me a screener for a horror comedy and i was like okay great so uh, a few months go by i get a screener and he's turned the film into a documentary on the making of the film and how it was canceled by cancel culture for it being like racist and homophobic i'm like and this is the stance you're gonna take on this it's like i'm not touching this man (laughs) (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) like i said dramas comedies things like that we really do try to get some sort of name on there if we really want to try to find a distribution for it Mm -hmm. i mean it doesn't have to be a big name i mean i consider any any um any uh, actor in like the top 30,000 star meter to have some sort of uh, monetary value on a deal. That's an interesting way to look at it. I, I, I'd never, I'd actually never heard anybody refer to it from the star meter, but that, that does make sense. Did you, you said you started out and you wanted to be an actor. Like what, what, like, did you find that you just with the business stuff, like you just had a knack for it? Like what? what well, I definitely what... do enjoy the business side of things. I've actually um, worked extensively in sales even before this. Uh, I've sold electronics, appliances, vacuums, mattresses, lawn care, and homeowners insurance. But while I was actually working at Geico selling the homeowners insurance, I had, uh, I got into a car accident. Uh, I was rear-ended on the highway and now I have uh, permanent neck and back uh, damage. Uh, I do, I, I do plan on trying to get onto a few sets, uh, but I'm definitely not, uh, just not as mobile as I used to be. Right. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to get into a few things locally in the, in the future. Yeah. Oh, and I, I noticed, uh, looking at your INDB, like a, a lot of, uh, producer, executive producer credits. Is that, is that for stuff that you rep? Is that part of the, yes, the, generally the, the that's, that's the that's the credit given to the sales agent that gets a um, gets okay. a get, gets a deal that the uh, filmmaker goes with. Totally makes sense. Yeah, I that, like that's, I was like, dang, because hey, I I think I just I think I just crossed like sixty on my producer credits. I was like, hey, these are right on my heels. <laughs> yeah, a couple of those a couple of those are funding. Um, yeah, yeah. We've, done, we, we've dabbled in funding acquisition for some lower budget stuff. Um, Thirteen fanboys on there because I found them uh, a good chunk of cash. 
Mm-hmm. They, but they decided to uh, handle distribution themselves, which, you know, I totally respect. I mean, their producer, Joel, has been is a veteran in the industry. He knows he knows right. what he's doing. And I'm really looking forward to adding it to my wall, though, when it releases. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're familiar with 13 Fanboy, right? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Plan on making it to Horror Hound? No, you know, I, I honestly have never been a big uh, convention guy. I mean, I have nothing against it. I, it's, just, it's just I never I, I never really took part in it. I love Horror Hound. I, I love yeah. Horror Hound. I also used to love Rock and Shock. They used to be over in Boston, but that one uh, that one shuttered a couple of years ago, I think. Yeah, I, I know some filmmakers that have done very well. You know, like you know, promoting themselves at cons. You know, selling DVDs at cons. Actually, that brings up a good question. So, like in a distribution, like like model, like when it comes to marketing, like what kind of a role do like cons and events play? Uh, with an actual like traditional distribution, not much, honestly, a lot of the distributors I, I, um, I, we work with, you know, are big enough that they have money for better marketing than just getting a booth at a table right. uh, at a, a booth at a uh, convention, but, uh, not, not too much really. Um, but on the flip side, they, they don't really discourage you from, you know, um, pursuing uh you know film festivals or convention screenings um they're usually okay with that they don't consider it a conflict with their distribution most times um so it's really usually something i'd never discourage anyone from doing it's always fun to see i'm actually going to um right before i go to rock and shop uh, to horror hound next next uh month Mm -hmm. i'll be uh going to the uh the buffalo dreams fantastic fest locally here in uh in buffalo and and so with film festivals, probably pretty much the same thing. I, yeah. I've always heard them they, unless it's like Sundance or something. Most people don't care. Yeah, that's unfortunately the case. I mean, there's a few uh, you know horror only ones that are considered pretty valuable, like Screen Fest or something. Right. Those look really good to a distributor. Uh, if you can get one of those, um, you know, definitely do it because you know that can that can that can be the difference uh, between whether or not a company picks you up. I actually have a film right now that I'm repping and it's a really good quality film. And one of my really good companies is like, I'm on the fence with it. Let me know if it gets picked up by any big film festivals. Right. That's literally, that's going to make or break that deal. It has a sales agency, you know, and you guys have been operating now. How long has Siphono been operating? It's like close to a decade. Close to uh, a decade. I'd say probably about seven, eight years now. Right. So have you guys considered, because I, I would assume at this point, you know, like you are talking to a lot of platforms and stuff directly. Have, have you considered like trying to transition? Honestly, into- no, we, we really don't work with a lot of platforms directly. Um, we do mm-hmm. have the, the capability to pitch directly to Netflix and Shutter, And other than that, um, and I mean, like as as you know, the Netflix one really doesn't come into play much at all. Right, right. Um, right. But like other than that, I mean, even Tubi, there's not really much that you that someone like us could even do with Tubi. Um, yeah. I mean, the way they actually have a page where you can like su- submit content. Yeah, I have seen it. They don't they don't pick it up unless you have an enormous catalog. Yeah. Um, even even a couple of our uh, distributors actually need to go through an aggregator just to get films onto Tubi. Yeah, because um, even their catalogs aren't considered large enough by Tubi standards. Yeah, I was trying to tell explain, explain that to someone the other day. They kept saying, "Why can't I just go direct? I just want to go direct." I was like, "I was like, I wish hey. you could." <laughs> yeah, I, I do too. I I, yeah, it'd be great, you know. But I was like, "Dude, I, I have I had fifty five titles in my library at that point." And I was like, they won't even consider it. Like, they won't even consider it. They, they're like, come back when you got 200 or something like that. You know, they're definitely not going to take a film or two. And I mean, a lot of the other streaming ones, I mean, yeah, we, we've never pitched directly. Those are usually, I mean, any distribution deal, the film's going to end up on Amazon, you, uh, you know, Google, PlayStation, whatever. Right. Um, there's also like Voodoo, which is a good one, but we don't pitch directly to them. Um, there's Redbox Digital. Um, Again, we don't pitch directly to them. I know most of that pitching is done directly by the distributor. Um, the reason that we do have the ability to pitch to Netflix and Shutter directly is sometimes you can double dip a little bit when you get to uh, like those premium streaming services. Mm-hmm. If they don't want an exclusive deal, you can get a deal with them and then also go to a distributor. And that way it's two separate deals and the distributor isn't taking a chunk of your licensing fee. 
Right. And um, we did that with uh, we did that with the Tom Savini documentary. Actually, it was picked up by Shutter and a separate distribution company for home release. So if, if people wanted uh, to submit to Saifuno, like uh, how do they how do they go about it? Uh, there's a web, uh, we do have a website, saifuno.com, uh, and there is a form uh, right through there where you can uh, submit through. Uh, you can also just hit me up directly, jlabor at saifuno.com. Um, just reach out. I'll happy to answer any questions people might have. Take a look at any screeners. And, you know, I, mean, I, just, and I just wanted to say, because I, I, I first, we've been Facebook friends for a while, but, you know, it's like one of those where kind of acquaintances, we might occasionally yeah, yeah. comment on something. But I, I've noticed you online over and over, like giving out advice, you know, with no like, hey, come to my company stuff, but just right. giving advice, giving it away. And I, I really respect that. And I, I, I wish more people in your position and people that, that know a little more about the distribution space would speak up more. Saifuno, and I didn't even know this when I first came with the company. Saifuno, because the, the company's name was created by Adam. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, I believe it's Welsh. Uh, Saifuno means to come together to unite. Uh, and we are, we basically, Adam put this company together and brought me on board because I share the same philosophy. Uh, Sifuno was basically created for filmmakers to have a safe haven, someone that they can, they can come to, that they can trust and rely on to get to actually honestly go out and try to get them the best deal. We don't charge anything up front. We don't get paid unless, unless the filmmaker gets paid. We really do want these people to succeed, even if they don't end up with us. If you'd like to help me support this channel, you can become a member for as little as 99 cents a month. Just hit the little join button right below the video and you can check out the options. Or you can check out my Patreon at www.patreon.com backslash jhorton. But whatever you do, keep making movies.